Today we'll talk about a number of important changes in the Madani society. Of course, the Prophet ﷺ had moved to a new place, it's a new era, everything is different. And so a number of different policies were put into place that were new and impossible to implement in Mecca. The first is the economic policies. The second is spiritual developments. Number one, economic policies. In Mecca, the Prophet ﷺ was a minority. He could not have an independent economic policy. However, in Medina, of course, the Prophet ﷺ is now independent. And therefore, one of the first things that the Prophet ﷺ did when he came to Medina, he visited the other souks of Medina. In those times, the Arabs, the Ansar we call them, primarily were involved in cultivation. They were not generally people that much of business. And if they wanted to do business, they would go to the souks of the Yahud. The Jewish tribes had the biggest souks outside of Medina. So the Prophet ﷺ visited those souks, and this is reported in Sunan Ibn Majah, and he disapproved of the practices, the cheating, or the deception. He disapproved of what's going on. And he said to the Muslims, this is not a souq for you. This is not a marketplace for you. And he went back to the masjid and with his own feet, he demarcated lines in the sand. He literally put a line and then another and another. And he said, this shall be your souq. And he instituted a souq towards the west of the masjid. And he said, this shall be your souq. So let it not be diminished and let no one tax the people in it. What new policies did the Prophet ﷺ bring? This is many different books and many different topics can be written. As you all know, he banned the practice of interest. Well, one of the most important things he did, he linked buying and trading to religiosity, to spirituality. He praised honesty and he criticized dishonesty. And he said that the righteous businessmen will be blessed on the day of judgment. He said that those who cheat and lie is not of us. And then of course, he also demanded a certain code of conduct. For example, the Prophet ﷺ forbade cheating and lying, swearing false oaths. He forbade hiding defects. And he used to monitor himself. He would walk in the souks that he instituted. And he once found the famous hadith in Bukhari. He found a date seller who had good quality dates at the top of the bag. But the Prophet ﷺ knew, Jubil told him what's inside. He put his hand inside and he pulled out rotting dates. Because he wanted to sell the bag. And the bag, the top of the dates has the fresh dates, right? So he says, buy the bag for 10 dinars, whatever. So he's going to close the bag and then sell it. But the bottom of the bag was rotting or not good quality. And the Prophet ﷺ said to him, whoever cheats us is not of us. He forbade even something that sounds so innocent, but there's a wisdom behind this. He forbade anybody living in Medina to act as an agent for a Bedouin who comes. Let the Bedouin go to the market and buy and sell himself. Why? Because when you have an agent who lives in the city, he will know the ins and outs and he will inflate or deflate and he's going to play the game. Whereas the Bedouin will go and he's going to give fair price. What do I want for my product? So the Prophet ﷺ forbade a Madani living in Medina to be the simsar or the agent or the middleman for the one coming from outside. Let the man come and sell on his own, right? Because he knows this is one of the biggest tactics or tricks that you don't know anything. And so the middleman gets a big cut and the poor Bedouin will get nothing. And subhanAllah, look at how modern economics works is that most of the Prophet, so much profit goes to people who don't do much, but they simply have the cunningness, right? And the Prophet ﷺ forbade this. Very early on, the Prophet ﷺ rejected the aswaq that were there and he established his own suq with his own Islamic, of course, Islamic sharia, of course, being fulfilled there. And of course, this suq flourished. And therefore, when the Jewish tribes were expelled one by one and their suqs obviously collapsed, by the time they were expelled, they didn't care about them because they had their own independent suq up and running. So financial independence, the Prophet ﷺ stressed it from day one, such that when other economies collapsed, it didn't affect the economy of Medina. Also spiritual practices. As soon as the Prophet ﷺ immigrated, one by one, the major commandments came down. Within a year, pretty much the entire sharia of ibadat had been revealed, except for hajj. Hajj could not be revealed because you can't do hajj, because hajj is enemy territory, right? So hajj is revealed, ninth year of the hijrah, Abu Bakr goes and does it, 10th year, the Prophet ﷺ does it. Hajj was delayed. But the other pillars, the Ramadan of the year of immigration, nothing happened. There is no sharia for fasting. Next Muharram, so nine, 10 months after the hijrah. Next Muharram, on the 10th of Muharram, the Prophet ﷺ made the fast of the 10th of Muharram wajib. Of course, we now know it's not wajib. And the Prophet ﷺ made a decree that whoever ate in breakfast in the morning, let him not eat for the rest of the day. Today is going to be wajib to fast. So the first obligatory fast was the stepping stone, one day only. Let them get used to it. Then that Ramadan, Ramadan of the second year, that Ramadan, 
Allah Azza wa Jalla revealed in the Quran, Surah Al-Baqarah, the verse that we recite, right? شهر رمضان الذي أنزل في القرآن فمن شهد منكم شهرا فليصمه Whoever is present in the month, i.e. he's not traveling, then he should fast that month, right? And some scholars say even the first Ramadan was encouraged. Allah knows best, but it wasn't made wajib for sure. By unanimous consensus, it was made wajib the second year of the Hijrah, right? And at that point in time, the tenth of Muharram became Sunnah. In Ramadan, Zakat al-Fitr is revealed, and Zakat al-Fitr, as you know, is the easier of the zakat. This zakat is just a food, right? One person's food, which is a happy meal or something like this that you get. Whatever as an average meal you can get it, right? You give it to a person. This is what the zakat al-fitr is. Again, to make them used to the concept of zakat. Within a few months, the same year, zakat came down. Zakat al-mal, right? So from zakat al-fitr, then zakat al-mal, right? So they're getting used to it. And obviously, at this point in time, of course, the basic rulings of the salah are now perfected. The Prophet said, pray as you have seen me pray. In Mecca, all of the salah were two rak'at. We said when he moved to Medina, then Dhuhr and Asr and Maghrib and Isha were all extended and only Fajr remained two rak'at. How you do it, how you do Tahara, how you do Wudu, the laws of Janaba and Ghusr, all of this came down within these first two years, i.e. by the time the second Ramadan finishes, all of these laws have been ordained. But again, realize a lot is happening in Medina.